sun in this video, just a simulation. Okay, here's one where the currents are in opposite direction. There's simulation, so there's not going to be any sound. Okay. So what I want to do now whoops, is talk about something called Ampere's Law. So imagine you have a long cur um, current carrying wire. And of course, we know that the magnetic field, due to the current carrying wire, is basically given by this expression. So let me erase the board. And let me set this up. You have a, a wire carrying current I. It sets up a magnetic field that circulates around the wire, makes perfect circles. Let's suppose I integrate the magnetic field around the field line. Okay, let's, let's integrate the magnetic field around a field line. What do we get? Well, it turns out if you, if you just integrate around this path, and let's go integrate the same direction of the path. So we integrate along this, this field line. What you'll get, since the field is going to be constant around this path, you're going to get the integral of B times uh, the radius times d phi because you're integrating, you're, that's an arc length. Okay. This integral is easy. You integrate from 0 to 2 pi. It's going to be the integral of mu naught i over 2 pi r r d phi. When all is said is, when, when everything's done, you're going to get mu sub naught times i. And this i is whatever is enclosed inside the, um, the path. So i is the current enclosed inside. Does that look familiar to you? Have you seen something like this before? Where the integral depends on something enclosed? From way back? Earlier in the semester? Yeah, from charging clothes. So this is this is like the magnetic analog of Gauss's law. Now, um, this expression is true in general for any geometry. I don't, I, we're not going to, we, we need some calc 3 to be able to derive it in general. I'm not doing it here. Okay. But this integral of the magnetic field around a, a path, a closed path, it's equal to mu naught i. This is called Ampere's law. It's true in general. And I, I, I only did it for this wire, but one can show it's true in general. Okay. 
It is analogous to Gauss's law. Here you integrate around a closed loop instead of a surface. The current I is a continuous current passing through any surface that's bounded by the closed path. Because whatever current goes through that loop is penetrating some surface. The current's penetrating any uh, an open surface. So we do have to include the surface bounded by the loop when we do this integral. And I'm saying it this way, but when you take Calc 3, you'll see, a, you'll see the reason why. This is related to something you learn in Calc 3 called Stokes' theorem. If you want to use this idea to calculate magnetic fields, you need a very high degree of symmetry to use it. And in fact, even, even, more, uh, even a higher degree of symmetry than you would need for Gauss's law. So what this means is there's very few problems we can use this for in, in terms of calculating um, magnetic fields. This is, always, this is true for any time-dependent field, a time-independent field. So maybe I should write that on the board. So this is true for any time independent magnetic field. We run into a problem when the magnetic field is time dependent and we will deal with that later. Okay. Now, if you're going to use this law to calculate a magnetic field, you need to make sure that the magnetic field is constant over the loop so you can pull the B out of the integral. Same, same idea as the Gauss's, what we, that we use with Gauss's law. Okay, here the B field has to be constant over the loop, and in Gauss's law, the electric field had to be constant over the surface. Now, the fact that the integral is not zero is, is really characteristic of any vector that has a rotation around a closed path. It represents how the magnetic field circulates. It curls. Okay, the magnetic field curls. So, um, it is related to something that you, you learn in Calc 3 called a curl. We won't, do, we won't deal with that here. Okay. So we can use this to calculate magnetic fields, just that there's not very many problems uh, we can do. Now, like I said, um, I, I can't do the general derivation here. Um, the general derivation involves the methods of Calc 3, okay? And when we include the, um, the surface, the, the surface is bounded by a loop, it's an open surface because the, the current is penetrating through any open surface that bounds the loop. Do you guys have any questions on this so far? Okay, so later on, the last bullet point. Well, the, the fact that this integral is not zero just tells you that um, this vector rotates. It circulates or it curls. Just like a mag it's, it's characteristic of magnetic fields. If you have an electric field, electric fields don't circulate. Time, uh, let me rephrase that. A time... Uh, independent electric field just diverges. And so if you try to do the, if you try to integrate around a closed path of the electric field, um, you'll get zero 
And that's because the electric field is conservative. The electric fields, conservative forces, they tend to have uh, a diverge, they diverge, they don't curl. Because if you want a deeper, Morgan, if you want a deeper explanation, we'd have to get into Calc 3, which I'm trying not to, I'm, I'm trying to say something that's related to Calc 3, but I'm not really trying to get into Calc 3. And just a characteristic difference between the electric fields and magnetic fields. The magnetic fields curl, electric fields don't. Is that okay, Morgan? Okay, I'm going to move on then. Uh, well, isn't it true that the magnetic field lines form circles? Yeah, and so this integral represents that, that characteristic. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Electric fields don't do that. Oh, I got to say, time-independent time electric fields don't do that. So what I want to do is I want to do an example. There's a, there's a homework problem just like this. I want to do an example I'll, okay so I'll look for a, a link to a video um, in terms of Calc 3 I would think that your Calc 3 book has a discussion about it too but I'll look for a link and I'll, I'll provide that link okay so what I want to do is I want to calculate the magnetic field inside and outside a long current carrying wire of uniform current density and radius r. And I want to plot b versus r. And then I want to talk about what happens if the current density is not uniform. Okay. So the outside is going to be easy because we already know what the field due to a, a long wire is. So I don't, really don't have to do much with it, but anyway. It's basically this problem I just did working backwards. Okay, so... This is a thick wire or a cylinder carrying current I. And I want to choose a loop outside and I'm going to integrate in this direction. I'm going to integrate this way, which is going to be in the same direction, really, as going to be the magnetic field. If you integrate around the same direction as the magnetic field, your current is going to come out positive. If you integrate in the opposite direction of the magnetic field, then your current will end up being negative because the dot products will, be, will end up being negative. So I want to use Ampere's law. So I'll write it up here, the integral of B dot DL is mu naught I. So I want to integrate the magnetic field around this path. I know that by symmetry the magnetic field is going to be the same for any value of R. And so really I'm, I'm really integrating around the circumference of a circle where B is constant around that circle. So I'm just going to choose a a path of radius r and so I'm going to take the integral of b times um, r d phi or d theta whatever you want to call it 
from 0 to pi and say it's equal to mu naught i enclosed. B is going to be the same value all the way around. I'm integrating in the same direction, so this dot product is 1. So I'm going to get B times 2, oops, B times 2 pi R is mu naught I enclosed. And so B, I enclosed is the total current I. And it's actually kind of weird to do this problem because we do, we can't keep, I kind of show you this expression by doing the problem the other way, but this is typically what we do in textbooks, um, or at least in the introductory class, because we de generally don't derive this in the introductory class. Okay, so this is for r bigger than the radius of the wire or the cylinder. Now what, what about inside? If we go inside, you got to choose a loop of radius r. Again, I'm going to integrate in basically in the direction of the field. I know the field is going to be that direction. The only thing that's different is going to be i enclosed. So I'm going to, I'm going to go up to here. I need to figure out how much current is enclosed inside the loop, so what do I do? How do I figure out how much current is enclosed inside this loop that's centered on the wire? Well, current can be written as the integral of j dA. We talked about this. j is the current density. So in this particular case, j is the total current divided by pi r squared. And dA is basically an element of area, so j is going to be i over pi r squared. This is constant, so this is going to be an easy integral. The unit of area, or the element of area, is this, like we've done before, and you integrate from 0 to r. And let me make these dummy variables. Okay. And this is an easy integral because I can pull this out of the integral. So I enclosed is given by this integral. This, this is basically going to be r over r squared r, um, r squared over 2 and so what I put in here One of the R's will cancel, and so what I'll get is B is equal to mu naught I over uh, 2 pi R squared times R. 
And then when little r is equal to big R, I get this. So really I should put an equal sign here. You have a problem just like this. The only thing different in the homework problem is that the, this part is not constant. In your homework problem, this, par, this problem is not... Actually, you have two homework problems. One, one is the case where this is constant, and another one is the case where this is not constant. If this is not constant, then you can't pull it out of the integral like I did here. And you did this, you did this with charge when we talked about uh, Gauss's law. So this, should be, this shouldn't be anything new to you. Okay. So if I want to plot the magnetic field, the magnetic field increases linearly up till the surface. And then it decreases 1 over R. Are we okay with that? Okay. What if, and, and this is going to be related to one of the homework problems. What if I have a wire, let's say the current's coming out towards us. Okay, this is a wire. Let's say the, the current's coming out towards us. And in the center, I have a hole in the wire. Like this. And the rest of it's solid. The radius of the wire we'll call A. The radius of the hole is A over 2. And let's, say, let's assume that you have a wire that's carrying current that's uniform. Where are the two at the bottom? You're talking about this one? Uh, um, yeah, this doesn't belong there, sorry. That was a mistake. Thank you. Hold on a second, wait, wait, maybe, it, maybe I'm, uh, um, I erased what I had, so. Oh, I know. Yeah, the two belongs there. Um, actually, the, the two belongs after I integrate. I, I put the two out too early. Yeah, nice catch. I put the two out too early. The two comes from when I integrate. Okay. All right. So what if I have a hole here? What do I do now? Well, I use superposition, okay, to find B. Let's, let's say I want to find the magnetic field at a point here. A location R above the center of this thing. I got to use superposition, so to find B, use Superposition. Treat the uh, the big wire or the big cylinder
as solid and calculate B due to the solid cylinder. Okay, that's the first thing. Second thing, this hole is that it's as if this, basically you have uh, the solid cylinder minus a current going in the opposite direction. So treat. the hole as a wire carrying current in the opposite direction. And of course, so you got to assume the same current density. Then determine the field. point P. I'll call this P. So first of all you treat the cylinder solid, find the feel at this point due to the solid cylinder, and then, then treat this hole as basically a current going in the opposite direction and calculate the magnetic field at this point. The difference in those two values is going to give you the feel at that point. Does that make sense? If, if this current has half the radius, if, if this wire has half the radius, how much current is going through it compared to the big one? A fourth. Okay, good. In the homework, you have something like this, except there's two holes in it, so you've got to do it twice. You've got to do the two holes twice. The one you do here is easy. The one you do at this point is a little bit harder. And the reason why is because, let me erase the board. When you do the, the one over here, the magnetic field Due to this, this guy, if the current's coming out of the board, right, if, if the current's coming out of the board, this is the magnetic field due to this guy. The magnetic field due to this guy, which is this distance away, this is the distance you are away, this distance, okay? is going to be perpendicular to this radius. I should draw it in the red. So you're going to need to know these angles. Okay. Now you have a hole over here in the, in, the, in the problem, and so that's going to create a field that looks like this down here. And so the total field is going to be the two Y components due to these holes uh, minus this guy. Or I'm sorry, this guy minus the two holes, uh, the, the Y components due to the two holes, because the X components are going to cancel. Yeah, there's no current going through the smaller radius. It's just a hole, but you treat the hole as a, as a superposition of two currents going in the opposite direction, because you end up it's a, physically it's the same thing. 
Does that make sense? You can do the same thing with Goss's law problems. And it's typically done with Goss's law problems. You do the same thing. Okay. So let's see how you do with this problem. If you have questions, don't, you know, don't hesitate to ask. But um, the, the, there's two main things. Is one, you've got to treat this as a whole, or you've got to treat this whole as a current going in the opposite direction. And then the other thing is you've got to make sure you treat the magnetic field as vectors, especially when you're over here. Because the field due to this guy at this point is going to have X and Y components. It's actually going to look like, it's going to look like this. And the one for down here is going to look like this. Okay. And, and since the geometry is easy, this is going to be carrying one-fourth the current of this guy. We don't have to set up the integral of, the integral of J dot dA. Are we okay with that? Hopefully that gives you enough information to be able to solve that problem. Okay, let me move on. So the next problem I want to do, I want to calculate the field due to a, a solenoid. An approximation to a solenoid is this guy. Can you guys see this okay? This is just a coil of wire. Okay. The, ideally, the solenoid has a long, its, its length is much, much bigger than its radius. You can calculate the magnetic field produced by a solenoid either using Ampere's law or B.O. Savar law. You can do either case. In fact, if you look at our class notes, the end of our class notes for, for this chapter, you will see a derivation for the magnetic field due to a solenoid using the B.O. Savar law. You should read through it. Okay. But I want to derive this using Ampere's law. It's much faster. Of course, it's an approximation because we're assuming the length is much, much greater than the, than the diameter. And you do get a simple expression. And you see coils in cars and, and doorbells, etc. Okay. All right. Let me draw a coil. Not the kind, in, not the kind described in this problem, because I, I have to separate the loops. I've separated the loops so we can see something here. In reality, we, when we're doing this problem, we're assuming the uh, the loops, the coils are very tightly wound. Let's assume that um, the current is like this. So that if I use the right hand rule all the way around, the magnetic field will point this way. So for a solenoid, or L much, much greater than R, or the diameter, okay, uh, B equals zero for R bigger than the radius of a solenoid. And B is uniform for R less than R. Because you can just make a, do, do an experiment to show that. Now, why would the field be zero outside? Well, first of all, the field lines 
will go like this. And these field lines really tend to go like this. However, as you get further and further away, and because you're, you're outside, you do, you do get um, a small feel. It's, it's very small. Okay, the longer this is, the, the feel is, gets closer and closer to zero. If you look around each loop and use the right-hand rule between the adjacent loops, you will see magnetic fields that are in opposite direction. They tend to cancel out. Just use the right-hand rule here and use the right-hand rule here, and you'll get opposing field lines between adjacent loops. Now, this coil is too small for you to see that. In fact, you could do an experiment to see that there's actually a field outside the coil. But if you get a really long one, a really long coil, we have one in the lab, it's about this long, okay? You'll see that the field outside is very, very small. This is, it's not the case with this. Okay, so these field lines in between the loops, they, they cancel each other out. As you get further and further away, that, that field gets smaller and smaller. These, these lines really loop really way out there. And of course, since R is big, those, those field lines, the field's gonna be very small. They're gonna be very, sep they're gonna be very uh, separated as you go outside. So we know the field is uniform inside, the field is zero outside. I want to use an Ampere's law. So I have to choose a path that allows me to calculate the magnetic field. I want to use this equation. So I'm going to choose a path that looks like this. I didn't draw very well, but let's call it L. Okay, I know it's not, it looks more like a rectangle. So I'm going to choose that path. So that means when I do this integral, I got to do this in four different parts. This part, this part, this part, and this part. So let me call this one, two, three, and four. We'll break it up into four parts. So I want to calculate this integral over this part of my loop. All right, the magnetic field is this way, and I'm going to integrate in this direction. What's the dot product going to be? What do you mean it doesn't look symmetrical? We have to have a high degree of symmetry so that we have a uniform field. We can pull the B out of the integral. I mean, the field's uniform inside, so you, you have a very high degree of symmetry inside. Isn't that true? I mean, it's hard to see it just from the geometry of what I drew. Of course, I exaggerated my coil, right? I, 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 spread, I spread the loops out so I can actually draw in between the coils. Okay, so you think about this, something like this, but make it very long. Are you talking about this one and this one? So my question to you is, if the magnetic field is this way and the path is this way, what's that dot product? Zero. So I don't have to worry about that. Yeah, the square is not very symmetric, is it? The square is not symmetric. You're right, you're right about that. The square is not symmetric. However, 
So that kind of throws you for a loop that, that I chose a, a, a path that's asymmetric. But I chose it because I know this integral and this integral are going to be zero because I'm integrating perpendicular to the field. What about this one? Yeah, it throws you for a loop. What about this one? If I, do the, if I integrate the field in this direction, what's the field outside? You got a field outside zero, so one, two, and three, there's no contribution. So what about, what about four? Well, the field's uniform in this direction. I'm integrating in the direction of the field, so that integral is just gonna be B times L. Y is two, zero. What's the field outside? What do we say the field was? I'm, in, in, I'm integrating zero. All right, this is my integral. For this, for, for this one, I'm, I have this. That makes sense? I mean, it's ideal, right? It's ideal that the field's zero outside. Because we're assuming this thing is really long compared to its, its, its radius. So I'm going to have b times l for this integral. And that's going to be equal to 2 pi, I'm sorry, mu naught, times i enclosed. Now here's the thing. How much current do I enclose in this loop? Every time I pass a loop, I'm enclosing current. So if I go along this thing and I enclose n loops, then the total current I enclose is n times i. And so the magnetic field is given by that expression. And this only allows you to get the, the magnitude. And so we define the number of turns per unit of length as n over l. And so this is the magnetic field to a solenoid, ideal one. This is the current enclosed in the loop, not in the length. I'm integrating over the length. The other side of the equation is the amount of current enclosed in the loop. Right? This is what's enclosed in the loop. This is basically me doing the integral over each segment of the loop. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, this, this inc inc incorporates the whole thing. I just broke this up into different pieces to make the, the, the problem easier for me to do. My black box is just an, uh, my black, it's just an imaginary square, just like the imaginary surface in Gauss's law. Okay. The black box is just a path I chose to do the integration. It's an imaginary path. Just like in Gauss's law, I chose an imaginary surface to calculate um, the flux. So it is, it is something imaginary. I could have chosen any path I wanted to, but that path made life easy for me. Yeah, n is the number of enclosed loops in, in this, in this uh, path. Okay, so um, if I make it 
uh, the, the path twice as big, I'm going to enclose twice as many loops. Okay? And in general, we assume that the number of turns per unit length is uniform along the wire. So we can call this the uh, uniform along the solenoid. So we'll call this the length of the solenoid, and this is the total number of turns in the solenoid, generally. Because in the real world, we don't have infinitely long solenoids. So let me... Um, let me show you So I want to show you the, uh, I, I calculated the magnetic field into a solenoid uh, in your notes. So I did it with Beals of law. Okay, so uh, I'm just showing you the final equation. And then when I make the solenoid become infinitely long, I do get the equation I have on the board. I also created a graph plotting the magnetic field as a function of position along the inside of the solenoid. And I, and I plotted it as a function of L over R. So I did a lot of work on this calculation. So you get to see what happens to the field to a solenoid. So when the ratio of L over R is 10, the length of the radius is 10, um, the field drops off slowly to zero as you go along the axis. So basically, when you're outside, this is essentially when you're outside the coil. When L over R is 50, you can see the, this thing, the top of the graph gets sharper. And you get to L over 500, outside the coil, so the length of the coil is basically the length over which that field is constant. Outside, the field is essentially zero. And this is where you get to see uh, how this compares to our approximation. So even, even at L over R equal 50, the approximation, whoops, the approximation mu naught ni works quite well. Okay. But yeah, your question, Morgan, regarding the loops that I'm choosing to do the integration, um, those loops are imaginary, just like in Gauss's laws, the surface is imaginary. We have other questions? The axis is parallel to the length of the solenoid. I, I guess I'm not sure which, I, I should be careful. What axis are you, are you asking about? Hold on a second. Let me go back to the... Go back to the graph. Oh, my x-axis? It's, it's along the axis of the solenoid. Okay, that's along the it's along the center. So, so I'm, I'm talking about this way. Okay. 
I calculate it along the, the, the axis this way. It's actually a much more difficult calculation if I do, the calc if I do it off axis. I would have to use a computer to do it off axis, okay? If I were going to use the B O sub R law to, to do this calculation, it'd be horrendous. But you can actually experimentally show, I mean, you can just make measurements inside the solid and it shows it's, when L over R is huge, the, the, the field's uniform inside. Does that answer your question? Yes. It drops off to zero even outside. Again, we're, we're assuming, you know, ideally we're assuming that the length is infinitely long, right? So you never get outside. But if L over R is huge, I mean, you can see it in the graph, right? Right, you can see in the graph, this, this region is outside of the solenoid. Okay? And this region over here is outside the solenoid. So yeah, that's a good question. I need to do one more example. There's really only a couple of them we can do using Ampere's Law. Here's, here's another one. And this was a torus. So a torus is a donut, donut shape. Let's assume we wrap a wire tightly around the torus and run a current through that wire. Using the same idea as for the um, solenoid, you'll see, you can actually show that the field inside the torus is quite uniform and the field outside the torus is essentially zero. And in fact, it, then it becomes very easy to calculate the magnetic field inside the torus because it's uniform. I basically use an Empyrean loop, again remember these are imaginary loops of radius r that's inside the torus. I use a circle. The magnetic field is going to go around in a circle and it's going to be uniform so I choose a loop that's circular. Just imagine taking a solenoid and bending it into a donut. Okay, just imagine trying to do that. So let me draw the torus or a toroid. These work great if you're trying to confine a bunch of charged particles in a field. The folks who do fusion studies, they try to do that. They try to confine charged particles within a, a field and they have a donut shaped, they pre-created a donut shaped magnetic field. Um, Tok I don't know if you heard the name, the, the word tokamax. Okay. Again, I'm, I'm not, these are supposed to be closely spaced. I can't, I can't draw them. I'm going to choose an Empyrean loop this way. 
and I'm going to assume the magnetic field, I'm going to integrate the magnetic field around the same direction as the loop so that I get a positive number when I integrate. If this thing has n turns, if this, if, this, if this thing has n loops, then when I integrate this, when I have n loops and close n, n loops times i enclosed. So i encloses n times i if the wire is carrying current uh, i. And so b then is mu naught n times whatever currents in the, in the wire divided by 2 pi r. If I were to plot the field as a function of position, for the ideal case, it looks like this. Okay, so here's where the solenoids, where it starts, let me call this A, and let me call this B, the field zero, it pops up, here's B, and then when you're inside here, decreases as one over R, and then goes to zero. That's what the field looks like inside. Am I off screen? Sorry. I'll fix that. That better? Okay. So that's it. And that's all I wanted to say regarding Ampere's Law. There's not a lot of problems we can do. So these are basically, there might be one more problem that can be done. I mean, there's one in your book. I didn't assign it. That can be done using Ampere's Law. And, and Morgan, you asked some good questions about, you know, the, and nobody ever asked me that question about the path that I chose was square, and you said, well, it's not, um, it's not symmetric. And, and, and you're right, it's, it's, it's not symmetric. Um, the path isn't, the field's uniform, so, we, <coughs> so that's okay. It's like doing the, the long wire uh, when we're using Gauss's law. Um, the path wasn't symmetric, however, we were able to use that path to calculate the magnetic field because three of the legs of that loop gave us no contribution. So the, the, path is, the path I choose doesn't have to be symmetric, but the, uh, the configuration does. Okay. All right, so I thought I was going to get into... Um, the next chapter, I might, I might start it in lecture because there's, I, I already have prepared a couple of demos, so I'll do them in lecture. There was one question that was asked last week. Um, I think Andrew um, asked it. We were talking about the work done on a wire in a uh, magnetic field. I don't know if you remember the question, Andrew. Uh, and uh, you had asked... And I'm hoping Andrew's here. I, I didn't check. Uh, you, what was asked was, if you put a wire in a magnetic field, does it change the resistance? And um, offhand, it, it might change the number of collisions per unit time, but really it doesn't make a big change in the resistance. And it's hard to see where the change would take place. However, if you have something that's ferromagnetic, something that has iron in it, you would actually see a change in the resistance. And that's an effect called magnetoresistance. Where you can control the resistance of a wire that has iron in it by changing the magnetic field. So you put the wire in a magnetic field, and you can change the magnetic field and change the resistance. So in a sense, there is an effect 
But it has to be with something ferromagnetic, not with something that's not ferromagnetic. So I hope I answered the question, um, Andrew. Okay, so I, I don't want to start the new chapter and have one minute, uh, now, now it's 10.50. So let me, um, I'll use the lab to uh, start the, the, um, the new chapter, because it's an important chapter. To me, it's probably the most interesting chapter of the whole book. Okay. All right, so I'll stop here and we'll, I'll see you in a little bit.